Hi guys, my name is Costa. Um, let me give you a quick intro on myself so you understand why I'm here and why I'm qualified to stand in front of you. Um, I don't know that I am, but ne nevertheless, my name is Costa Ligris. I am an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur in residence at MIT. Um, I'm a lecturer at MIT. I teach a class called Building Entrepreneurial Ventures on Monday nights. Um, and that's what I do as my side hustle. My real job is I am the CEO and founder of a fintech startup in Boston called Stavvy, S-T-A-V-V-Y. Feel free to check us out at stavvy.com. Uh, some of the examples I'm going to talk about today are from lessons uh, in ter terms of things that I've learned uh, building and scaling my businesses. Stavvy is my fourth business. My other three businesses are all still around. They're professional services businesses and a real estate development company. Um, I built those um, from the ground up with no outside fun uh, funding. Stavvy, however, is a fintech company uh, that has grown um, really, really fast over the last uh, couple of years. We started with six people pre-pandemic in a small little space at a venture fund in Boston um, that some friends uh, are the general partners of, uh, and have grown to about 150 people in about 18 months. Um, and so Stavvy has grown drastically through the pandemic because we build tools that allow financial institutions to do transactions that were traditionally done on paper and in person online. And so we are like DocuSign on steroids. We do notarization online, video recording, identity of the individuals. We know who they are. Um, we track them. Is that for me? I wanted some water. Thank you. They brought me just enough. So, um, and so my background is kind of interesting. I am a med school dropout. I went to medical school. I dropped out and went to law school to be a patent lawyer. I graduated at a terrible time with a dot-com bubble burst. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but you can start doing the math. That happened in 01, and I was already a lawyer then. Um, and so I built my first three businesses over 17 years before going back to MIT to get my MBA. I got my MBA, graduated. Bill Ouellette, who's doing a presentation around the corner, his probably sucks, um, asked me to come to the MIT and to work as an entrepreneur in residence, EIR, because of my background in financial services, um, legal and real estate, we didn't really have somebody that had domain expertise in fintech, prop tech, legal tech, and insure tech. So what does my life as a CEO feel like every single day? This is what my life feels like. <laughs> But nevertheless, uh, what do I want to talk about today? I want to talk about some of the lessons that I've learned from some of the mistakes that we have made early on uh, and hopefully instill upon you guys. Uh, earlier, the, the, the group that was here earlier started with a much smaller group, so we went around the room, but we had people that were interested in business, students, startups, people that work in incubators, academia. And so, you know, please pull from this presentation what you think is valuable to yourselves. But, you know, what does scaling a startup mean? Why is it important? Uh, and what are the challenges? And by the way, this is designed, <laughs> when you look at that green bar, like the challenges, there are more challenges um, than there are wins uh, in building a startup, especially as you're building and scaling. We, uh, the best analogy is, you know, w w being a startup CEO and being part of an early stage team, you jump off of the mountain and then you build the airplane on the way down. Um, and so it's a risky proposition. It's not for everybody and that's okay. And we talk about that at MIT, but um, I want to talk a little bit about the sort of this foundation. Why is it important to have a clear mission and vision? One of the first people that I hired in the leadership team at Stabby early on, um, she's now our COO, is a woman named Amy Hochthausen. Amy and I went to MIT together. Um, she was actually in sports, college sports. Before that, she was a commissioner for the NCAA, um, the, the, um, uh, the National Collegiate uh, Athletic Association, right? National College Athletic Association. And uh, Amy is a thought leader in diversity and inclusion, um, especially for women in sports and, and in academia. And so uh, she was, before employee 30 or 40, we brought Amy on board and I hired her to be our chief impact and culture officer. And I, I bring this up at this slide where we're talking about a strong foundation because one of the most important things about what I'm gonna talk about today is people. And we're going to talk about building a highly functional team in a minute. But um, people build businesses. People create problems, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, and people build products. And uh, it's really, really important to focus on people. And so having a clear mission and vision is really important. One of the first things I asked Amy to do, and by the way, when I went to my board, I was like, by the way, I'm hiring a C-level executive whose job it is to be responsible for our mission, our vision, um, and, uh, and diversity and inclusion within the company. And they were like, okay, we love it. It's a great idea, but like maybe we should hire this person like later when the company is bigger. And I argued no. 
Uh, because at the end of the day, you will get a culture. Whether you decide to build it yourself or whether it builds itself, you will end up with a culture and an organization. There is no such thing uh, uh, as too early to focus on, on vision um, and, and mission. And so, um, and by the way, you could do it as a founder. If you have the time and the resources and you feel that you can do it as you're building and scaling, uh, you can do it as a founder or somebody else on the team can do it. But I felt because, because I, I knew that we were about to go into this sort of this ultra, um, ultra hyper growth scale, I really wanted somebody that knew, knew more about this than I did. I put Amy in a room with people of very, very different opinions, arguably dangerous for her. <laughs> there were people in that room that believed that Donald Trump lost the election, that he was you know, sent by God to, to save America. There were people in the room that thought he was the most evil human being ever created by mankind. And they were in a room for three days. And what came out of that room was a bunch of, a, 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 a bunch of um, values that you, you, can, you can see at Stavi.com around collaboration, around you know, creating an environment where we can work to consume good intent. Um, and it, it really is important because it, it anchors the company in a way that you speak a common language. It also allows you to understand that when you're going through difficult times, you can turn to your values. We treat it almost like cult-like. When we have meetings, we put the values up and we read them out loud. Somebody from the leadership team will pick on somebody in the audience and be like, read this value, read out loud. Some people in our leadership team have memorized them. Um, and so as you're building a strong foundation for your company and your business, one thing that is really, really important is um, you do have to focus around understanding your target audience uh, and doing market research. Now, a lot of times you hear us talk about at MIT and we teach a lot about primary market research. So we tell you, we want you to do all this primary market research ahead of time. It's really important to understand your personas and who you're selling to and who your customers are and what the decision-making unit is. And that is all true. However, be very careful that market research doesn't end once you start developing products and selling them. It is a, it should be like the constitution, alive, happening all the time, being reinterpreted all the time because market research should evolve with your company. If you've heard the concept that if you're not growing, you're probably dying. I believe in that and I subscribe to that. It's really important to understand through market research, constant market research. It may happen in different parts of your organization. It may not be the founders doing it anymore and it might be your success team and your support team, but it's really, really important. In my Slack channel, at Stabby, uh, I follow channels that some CEOs may not be following. Every night before I go to bed, I look at all the support tickets that were opened. I may not open every single one of them. I might open like one or two and take a look at the details, but I'm looking at the topic. I'm looking at the subject. I'm looking at the customer. It's really important to understand what your customers are doing, what they're saying, how they're using your product. Market research never stops. And you see this all the time. And really successful companies constantly are doing market research. They're doing more R&D and they're spending more and more money and, and emphasis around that. And by the way, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. Amazon tried to build a cell phone. It was a disaster, right? Google has built products that have been completely put away and will never, never be touched again. Apple's done it too. But the reality is that market research has to constantly evolve and it's part of, it should be part of your company's DNA. And you need to constantly revisit and refine your value proposition. How are you creating value for your customer today? Because it can be very different six months from now and a year from now and two years from now. It can be different because of your product. It can be different because of the macro. The environment can change. At Stavio, we build workflows that take transactions that were done that were done in person, done digitally. Before the global pandemic, before COVID-19, only three states in the US allowed you to do notarization online. Only three. Yesterday, the governor of Massachusetts signed the 43rd law. Right? We have 50 states now. We have 43 permanent laws in 43 states. Washington, D.C., 44. Puerto Rico, 40, um, 45. Guam, 46. Federal bill passed in the House a couple, uh, a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago. It's in the Senate now. When that passes, federal law that allows remote notarization to occur. The macro has changed. The products that we were offering before and the value that they created then and what consumers are asking financial institutions for now, very different. COVID also has changed the framework, not just the legislative uh, effect. COVID has changed the reality. People don't want to go to branches for everything. And so we believe that we can power the brick and mortarless financial institution. 
right? You don't have to just use a startup bank. You can still use Bank of America, but you can do a lot of things online now that you didn't have to go and do in person. And so your model has to be scalable. That means that everything you build, your products, your features, your strategy, your business model, your pricing, everything needs to be able to evolve. Everything should be scalable. I'm not a marketing person. I'm more of a strategy person. I think big and then I, I hire smart people to execute. But um, a scalable marketing strategy is also as important as a scalable sales strategy. And so identifying the most effective sales and marketing channels are important. The example that I gave when I did this workshop just, pri just prior to this was Dolby. Has anybody heard of the company Dolby, D-O-L-B-Y? Of course. How many speakers, hardware, how many speakers does Dolby make? None. They never made any hardware. Their entire business is a licensing model. Uh, I was, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very um, grateful to have worked with all the startups that you're going to hear pitch tomorrow. I worked with all of them as a mentor. I interviewed them. Um, and you're going you're to see one of the startups is a pure licensing business. Licensing businesses are great. I know you guys have a version of it here in the States. You, you see the shark, shark Tank, right? Mr. Wonderful. He loves royalty deals, right? There's a lot of different business models that exist out there. And understanding what those business models look like, that's why the math is important. It's great to build great products, but it's, it's got to make economic sense. And so understanding how much money you need to spend on marketing and for, uh, and for uh, customer acquisition is really important. And optimizing that and then building it, executing on it, building a sales funnel around it, and then having a strategy in terms of customer acquisition and retention. Um, and that can move, move into different aspects of the organization. This is very different for direct-to-consumer businesses and much more different than direct-to-consumer businesses versus biz, uh, B2B businesses or B2B2C businesses. So, you know, it, it just, it's just a, a snippet of some of the things you should be thinking about from a strategy perspective. If you leave here in 14 minutes and you remember nothing else, I really want to focus on building a highly performing team. Um, we cannot do what we do without the team that we have. And people are really, really important. And building a culture is really important. People ask me a lot of times, like, what are you the most proud of at your businesses? Um, <clears throat> the thing that I'm most proud of at my businesses is that my title companies and my law firm have for three conse consecutive years in a row, even, even after I left, have won best employer in the greater Boston area for three consecutive years for small and medium enterprises. Stavi won for two consecutive years, um, Forbes magazine, uh, top startup employer. We were number eight in the country last year, our first, our first year when we hit over 100 employees. It is the thing that I am the most proud of. It is the culture that we have built, the team that we have built, the collaboration that exists within the organization. Keys to Apple is Apple's an incredibly collaborative company. And so... You know how many committees we have at Apple? No. Zero. We have no committees. No committees. We are, a very, we are organized like a startup. One person's in charge of iPhone OS software. One person's in charge of Mac hardware. One person's in charge of iPhone hardware engineering. Another person's in charge of worldwide marketing. Another person's in charge of operations. It's, we're organized like a startup. We're the biggest startup on the planet. And we all meet for three hours once a week and we talk about everything we're doing, the whole business. And there's tremendous teamwork at the top of the company, which filters down to tremendous teamwork throughout the company. And teamwork is dependent on trusting the other folks to come through with their part without watching them all the time but trusting that they're going to come through with their parts. And that's what we do really well. And we're great at figuring out how to divide things up into these great teams that we have and all work on the same thing, touch bases frequently, and bring it all together into a product. We do that really well. And so what I do all day is meet with teams of people and work on ideas and solve problems to make new products, to make new marketing programs, whatever it is. And are people willing to tell you you're wrong? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, other than snarky journalists. I mean, people that oh, work Oh, yeah. For no, we have wonderful art. I'm going to stop there because this video goes on. I want to be respectful. I'm totally fine with my team coming and saying, here's the problem. Here's what we're working on. We're going to solve it. We'll let you know if you need to know anything else. That's fine by me. 
I won't even touch it. I don't even go, I won't even go near it. But I like to know. It all depends on what type of a leader you want to be. But I can tell you, the level of transparency that needs to exist within the team is really, really important. You have to be willing to be vulnerable around each other. We do this thing called operating manuals. You know when you buy something and there's a manual, it teaches you how to use it? I make all of my executives and all of my managers and above create an operating guide for themselves. How do you show up in distress? How do you want to receive feedback? This is really important stuff, understanding how to work with each other because we don't focus a lot of time on that in startups. We jump into it and we start working and it gets really, really exciting and all this stuff is happening and then we, we forget that we need to give each other feedback and support and teach each other how to grow. And by the way, it extends outside of your team. It extends to your partners. How do you find the right strategic partners? I'm a lawyer by, by training initially. I love to negotiate, but I do not negotiate character and I don't negotiate integrity. I don't do business with people that I don't want to do business with. Because usually it's not worth it. It will end up costing you money at the end or costing you reputation, which is worse. And so it's really important to understand that. So you got to do your diligence around the partners that you're, you're, you're building strategic partnerships with. And by the way, we're not talking about financing right now. We're going to talk about it in a second. We're going to try to get through as much of this material as possible. Understanding how your investors behave is really important. They will all give you a list of companies that they give you references like, oh, look at this company. This founder loves me. Ask them to give you a list of companies that failed. Ask to speak to those founders. How did they behave in those board meetings when things were not going as planned? Leverage partnerships for growth. Build these relationships and understand that partnerships have to be two-way. They can't be one way, otherwise they don't work, they break. Is there value for both sides of the equation? <clears throat> so I'm gonna just talk about uh, uh, funding just in general. The macro right now sucks. Okay, if you're an early stage company and you've got a good idea, you're going to raise money. The terms have changed, how you raise it, how much you're going to raise, all of that has changed drastically uh, over the last couple of, uh, uh, over the last year, year and a half. Last summer was a screeching halt. It's the, it was the beginning of a nuclear winter. We have seen it before, the dot-com crisis. We saw it again after the housing crisis in, in the US, 07, 08, 09. Uh, but the reality is that deals still happen. There is still capital out there to invest in companies. Do not let that deter you. If anything, these difficult times make for stronger teams. I like to think of, I think of myself as a wartime CEO. I like being put up against the wall in difficult, challenging times. I do my best work when I'm anxious. Um, I don't like it when it's sort of like calm. <laughs> I'm the pilot that likes to be in the storm. But I understand that that's not for everybody. And right now, it's really hard because you have to balance how much money do you want to raise and what are you willing to give up for your company? Equity is the most important thing, right? You could only cut it up so many ways. And so it's really important to understand like that putting together the deal has to be the right deal. And so what does that mean? It means that you need to be prepared better than ever for financing with diligence and with materials. If you have customers, if you have contracts, if you have financials, corporate, go corporate governance documents, policies, you have to have all that ready for potential investors because now they're doing diligence. They were not doing great diligence for a couple of years. They were like, grow at all costs, grow, 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 spend, spend, spend. Now they're like, eh, grow slowly, grow carefully, grow revenue, don't grow expenses. And so it's really, really important to understand how much do you need to raise versus how much do you want to raise? And understand that after you raise, you get to like breathe for a little bit of time, but you're in an in in innovation-driven entrepreneurial business, you're gonna need to raise more money. Probably right after you raise, you can take a breather for a few weeks, do you like my real work, <laughs> and then I'm raising again because I'm building relationships with other investors and making sure our current investors know what we're doing and what we're building and, and what's happening. Um, capital efficiency and being responsible with your burn and your spend is more important now than ever. It's always been important, but it's much more important now than ever. Money is no longer free. It is really, really expensive. The deal structures are, have changed drastically. Prioritize your tasks and manage your resources. Don't just go after deals that don't make sense. Logos don't pay bills. Cash pays bills. When somebody comes along like, oh, I want to partner with you. I want to do this. Build me this. Build me that. I tell my team all the time, don't bring me something and request a reprioritization of skills or resources and allocation, reallocation of resources in the company unless somebody is willing to sign a contract and attach a check to it. We do not do business with ideas. 
right? Right now, when it comes to resources that are precious and we're hiring less people because we have to be very capital efficient, everyone's time is super valuable. Monitor your performance metrics. If you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. You have to understand where you're spending money, where your business is coming from, what your margins look like. This is stuff you need to know cold. You gotta manage your cash flow better than ever. You gotta stretch every dollar. Going to a conference, maybe you don't go for three days, maybe you go for two days, maybe you just go for one day. Maybe you don't go unless you have meetings lined up and there's value to be created there. And sometimes there is, but be really careful around where you're managing your cash flow and what that looks like. And the same applies for your customers. Early on when we signed up some of our early customers at Stabby, we had no automated billing, it was manual. We were, we, we, were, we were so focused on building product and, and getting new customers on board and we were not focused on sending out bills. We sent bills to some customers for four or five months worth of transactions. And they were like, hey, what, what is going on here? We know we owe the money, but nobody wants to get a bill for five months. It's just, it's, it's bad form. And so understanding the cash flow is a bi-directional thing. It's not just the money that your business needs. You want to be able to book it, but also recognize it. But you also want to treat your customers with that type of respect, right? The hard part right now is when you're having reductions in workforce, when you're trying to optimize cash, when you're trying to optimize resources, how do you do all of this in an organization that is scaling and still maintain that culture? This is the balancing act. That video that I showed you, that jumping in the beginning, that's the hard part. How do you do this in a way that's empathetic with transparency so that your team knows? We have had a reduction in workforce at Stabby. We had to. There were excessive resources in some organizations. Um, and then I called an all hands meeting and addressed the entire company and told them what we did and why we had to do it. And then the, the most common question that of course people are going to ask is, is there a chance this is going to happen again? You have to be honest and transparent with your team. If you want them to be honest and transparent with you, you need to be honest and transparent with them. And so, you know, you, you can tell them exactly what's on the, on what's on deck. I, I, have actually, I actually have respect for some, found, some, some leaders that I've seen over the course of the last couple of months. They've told the company there's going to be layoffs. We're, we're still working on it, but I want you to know it's going to happen. It actually allows for natural attrition to occur earlier sometimes. Sometimes it saves people's jobs because somebody's like, you know what? I'm not really happy here. I should leave. If I leave, I could save somebody's job. Transparency is a powerful thing. People will never, for, there's a famous quote from, I think, Maya, Maya Angelou. You know, people will, will forget what you said, but they will not forget how you made them feel. And so it really is important to, to make sure that you're treating, treating people treating people well. Um, you got to remain agile. And that Steve Jobs thing is, is gold, right? Because they were a big company. Says we're like the, we operate like the largest startup in the world. Why do startups win? Why can they beat incumbents? They can move fast. They don't have committees. They don't have all the red tape and the bureaucracy and like got to go here and then talk to this person and then allocate resources or like, ah, you got to move person from one department to another. In a startup, you can do all that. Everyone, everyone can get together and, and, and figure it out. So I want to close with some takeaways. Scaling helps the business grow. It's important, but you have to scale your marketing. You have to scale your sales strategy. Um, high performing teams. I cannot, I cannot lean into this enough. High performing teams and uh, lead to increased productivity. They increase to more innovation. They're the best possible thing for R&D. They make your customers happy. You're not gonna be able to touch all your customers as a founder or as an entrepreneur, but your team will. And, and when your team is happy, your customers will be happy. Uh, and you gotta manage growth responsibly right now. We're in a place right now where capital is really, really restricted. Um, there is capital that can be taken away, uh, that can be that can be raised, but it's very different than it was in the years past. And so maintaining that financial stability and being really responsible at how you're spending money and deploying resources is really, really important. So thank you guys. Um, I, hope, uh, I, I hope I didn't go too fast. I wanted to cover everything and get us back on track and on schedule. Um, I'm going to close with, if you can clearly articulate the dream or the goal, start. Uh, T equals zero is what we say at MIT. The time is now. Uh, Simon, Sinek, uh, Simon Sinek has another amazing quote that I love, which is, if you don't understand people, you don't understand business. And I'm really passionate about how we built our culture at Stavi. I hope uh, that you took something away from today. Available for questions. I'll stick around afterwards. Kligris at MIT.edu. You can email me. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Follow me on, on Twitter. I can be controversial at times, but it's because I'm passionate. Thank you. <laughs>